Why do cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin go up in value over time? Now, if you've been watching the news for any period of time, or if you're into the crypto universe like I am, you might have noticed that Bitcoin's price has been doing pretty exceptionally well lately. In fact, you know, over the last couple days, it's reached a new all-time high since the peak of the 2017 bull market. And of course, I'm sure you have all your friends and family talking about, well, what is this Bitcoin? Can I buy it? I guess I should finally get some, all that kind of stuff. Of course, there was a time not too long ago when the price was not doing very well. It was down from all time highs, etc., etc. But factoring out tops and bottoms of cycles, the price of cryptocurrencies in general, and of course, Bitcoin specifically, tends to be going up. Over the last two years, Bitcoin, the first major cryptocurrency and the asset class's leader, has significantly outperformed just about every major asset from gold to treasuries and more. And compared with government currencies, of course, this performance difference is staggering. And I do feel like, to a certain extent, this is kind of a given at this point where people just sort of assume that the price will go up over time or they just assume that it won't, but neither side really has a clear idea of why it does or why it possibly could not. So this is a great opportunity for a little bit of a teaching moment. So let's jump right into it. So why do cryptocurrencies really tend to go up in price? The first point, of course, is scarcity. Scarcity means there's a limited amount. You can't just get infinite number of it. So a limited edition anything, maybe a natural resource, things like that are all scarce. You're scarce. There's only one of you that I know of, unless cloning has gone really crazy since the last time I've checked. But what would scarcity have to do with value? Well, basically it all comes down to supply and demand as always. Put really simply, if there's a certain demand for an item, like a product or a natural resource, and the supply goes down, as in there's fewer of them, then that will make the actual price or the value of that individual object go way up. So let's take this example, these cool little dashy glasses here. Some people like them, I don't know, there's a, I do. There's a certain value for them and people will be willing to pay a certain amount of money for them. Now, of course, if you duplicate this by, you know, who knows how much and they're just everywhere, then of course people will be willing to pay less because they just kind of have the same demand. Of course, if they become super popular as a whole bunch are created, then of course the price won't go down with the supply going up. But all other things being equal, if the same amount of basic demand for this exists, if there's fewer of these, like this is the last in the world, but yet people still want it the same amount that they wanted it before, then all of a sudden the price of this is going to go way up. And that's basically the reason why cryptocurrencies tend to become more valuable is because they are scarce. Most of the major cryptocurrencies have limited inflation. They don't keep printing more and more and more. In fact, most have a finite and amount, meaning that there will only ever be, what is it, like 21 million Bitcoin or around 19 million Dash or whatever else it is, 84 million Litecoin, whatever that was. And so because of that, considering the demand is always the same, then having a more restricted supply will mean good things for the price. Approximately every four years, Bitcoin's inflation rate goes down by 50%, an event known as the halving. In late 2012, Bitcoin's annual inflation rate was about 25%, dropping to around 9% by mid-2016, then most recently to under 2% by May of this year. By 2024, the rate could be under 1%. Inflation reductions have historically been observed to precede bull runs. Of course, this is generally true for cryptocurrencies, but there's quite a few out there and quite a few operate differently. Not all have the exact same inflation rates, the exact same end coin supplies or even a fixed supply. Some have variable supplies and some are controlled by entities that can essentially print more, which you know sounds a whole lot like the central banking system that a lot of people were looking to avoid by going to this. And so not all cryptocurrencies are created equal in this regard. That's one of the reasons why Bitcoin has been consistently doing well is because it has this limited supply that does not seem to be going anywhere and its inflation rate is fixed and pretty low. For example, Litecoin has a pretty similar inflation rate and halvings, but is simply a couple years behind. Dash for years had a lower inflation rate than Litecoin, but has a much more frequent but gradual reduction of about 7% each time, resulting in a lower rate for Litecoin today. 
Monero had a very high inflation rate in the beginning, but a very steep decline, so that now it's about on par with Bitcoin despite being a half decade newer. This brings up an interesting point that some cryptocurrencies do have an infinite supply, usually known as a tail emission, which is usually very low. So for example, you might have something like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, all those, Litecoin, Dash, all have finite supplies. There will only ever be a certain amount in existence ever, no matter how long the world lasts. Now, coins like Ethereum and Monero have infinite supplies. There won't necessarily be a cap on the ultimate supply over a long period of time. Now, of course, this doesn't bode well for being a good store of value on its face value because you don't want something that, say, again, back to these fun dashy glasses, say there's one of these and I'm holding on to it because it's a collector's item, but then there will be more produced infinitely and none will be destroyed. They just will keep on being created over time. So eventually there will be infinite number of these. Then of course the value of this is just not going to be good long term. So you might hold it in the short term because something else is going down quicker or you might just of course have some because you like them. I do. But eventually the value of this is going to trend to zero. Now this isn't really a problem in a lot of these tail emission cryptocurrencies because at some point the inflation rate is so low that it would take something like 100 years for the actual value to be affected in a serious negative way from just holding on. It just at some point it gets so low that mm, who really cares? But it is important to note which ones are finite and which ones are infinite. Now all this talk about inflation being perceived as being bad and you're thinking why is creating more items more units of this why is that necessarily a bad thing well it isn't that it's a bad thing it's where do those extra go so for example say you have a unit of currency and the supply gets doubled every year that's like you know it's a huge amount of inflation that is really a bad thing if you just have the same amount of the currency. All those new units go somewhere else, and therefore that now the same, let's just say the same demand for the entire cryptocurrency that happens. If the supply gets doubled and someone else gets those coins, then you essentially lost half your value if the demand is the same to those other people. They basically took half your value. And that's been one of the big gripes behind government controlled central bank currencies is they keep printing more and more and more, making your money worth less, especially in this case with the Venezuelan Boulevard. This is worth a whole lot less. And they keep all that extra money and they use it to fund programs or, you know, often wars and awful things like that and you don't get to keep any of it. Now you'd be much less grumpy about that if say they doubled the supply every year, but they actually doubled your own supply because then that would mean that all demand being about the same, each unit of your currency would be worth half as much, but you get twice as much, so you wouldn't really need to care. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, cryptocurrency does have inflation, and where does that go? So in the case of Bitcoin and most cryptocurrencies, whether they're strict proof of work or proof of stake or something else, they end up going to security. So with Bitcoin, it's towards miners who run complex algorithms with specialized hardware to basically make it really hard for someone else to do the same and then start taking over the network and reversing transactions and stealing people's money. It's kind of like, you know, let's say paying for safekeeping. So the now low, you know, Bitcoin inflation rate basically pays for those coins to be secure over time. And of course, other coins have different schemes as well. For example, Dash has a second layer called masternodes, which are incentivized nodes that do a whole bunch of extra functionality and also has a treasury, which a whole bunch of other coins like say Decred, PIVX, Smart Cash, I don't know, the list goes on, where a portion of the inflation goes towards paying developers and paying other community outreach programs, whatever else. And so basically the inflation rate can be thought of as you are paying for services. Usually those services are just security, just making sure your money's safe and can't be stolen by someone else. But in other cases, they can go to other things, which the assumption is for you, they'll increase the value more than they'll take away by diluting the supply. And of course, the assumption is over a long enough term, a lot of this will go away. A lot of the inflation will be pretty low. In the case of Dash and other coins which have masternodes or staking, holders of the coin can perform special services for the network and receive a portion of the inflation rate back to themselves. In some cases, this can be enough to partially or completely negate the effects of the inflation rate. 
second thing that gives a lot of value to cryptocurrencies is speculation, which basically means betting on the future value. So, for example, let's say the, the value of Bitcoin is whatever it is today. A lot of that is people speculating, seeing this is a great asset. This is a great technology. It's worth this much right now as far as what people are using it for. But I'm going to pay more for it because I think in the future, everyone's going to be using this. This will be the new global financial system. And therefore, the value will be even higher in the future. So it's speculating in favor of Bitcoin. Or let's be honest, in a lot of these cases, it's speculating against government currency, saying I would rather overpay for a cryptocurrency today because I think that in five years time, the value of those dollars, the purchasing power is going to be so low that it just it won't be any good. So I'd rather bet on that future and therefore pay for something that might not have earned that value today. Of course, a lot of speculation is fluff. It's hype. A lot of it is, oh, this is going to the moon. Oh, I saw this new press release that said they're coming out with this new technology. Oh, I saw this awesome presentation here. Oh, amazing stuff. And I'm just going to go put my money towards it and then hope that other people buy in as well and it keeps putting the price up and eventually it gets high enough I can sell it and make a profit even if it never actually delivers. Of course there's a little bit of that and I have to say especially in a particularly new technology and asset class like cryptocurrency most of it is probably speculation at this point. CoinFair Value is a great site that tracks the market price of cryptocurrencies against their current fair value which is more indicative of real use. While it obviously can't be a perfect metric to show the difference between pure speculation and actual use in commerce, it's still pretty valuable. I interviewed the site's founder a while back. Check out that interview for more information on how it's calculated. Now don't get me wrong, speculation isn't necessarily bad. Consider it like, let's say, an investment in the future, raising seed capital. Although in this case, it isn't necessarily a company, it's a cryptocurrency, a whole currency and ecosystem. Basically, if you see good signs, say, wow, this technology is great, I like the way they got their economics on point, I like the scarcity, I think that this will be very useful in the long run, I think they're doing a lot of things really well, but no one's caught on to this yet, so I'm willing to buy it, I'm willing to put money behind it that's not necessarily warranted today because someday in the future it definitely will be and it might not even get to that point if I don't get in right now. But of course speculation is essentially gambling, it's risk and so it shouldn't be that a project is entirely based on speculation or mostly based on speculation for a huge period of time. Eventually things should even out and it should be more based on actual real world usage and valuation today than just hoping it'll be a different price in the future. And finally, utility. This feeds into that part I was talking about in the beginning about supply and demand. This is where the demand part comes in. Why do people actually want this stuff? Of course, part of it could be the speculative demand, right? People want it because they think it'll go up in value in the future. But some of it is usefulness today. Of course, one of the biggest reasons people have traditionally gone towards cryptocurrency is because it's permissionless. Anyone can compile their own wallet from scratch, from source code, whatever, and then send and receive the stuff. Doesn't matter where in the world they are, doesn't matter anything else. It's completely open to anyone to use and censorship resistant. And of course, this has a lot of value to people who are being barred from holding money or from sending and receiving it for whatever reason. And also, it's very useful to people who believe that just the principle is worth investing in. That even though they're not being barred from sending and receiving money at all, even though they aren't personally a victim to this, they still want something that that can't happen to. Or of course, they could just be betting in the future that, hey, at some point I might get censored, so might as well buy into this now. Now, of course, the radical transparency and auditability of most cryptocurrencies is a very valuable thing. You get to see where the money's moving, kind of who has it, even though you don't know the individuals behind it. You get to see the big money movements. You get to audit the supply and make sure it actually is scarce, like I talked about earlier, rather than where something where there might be double or triple the actual supply, you just can't see it. Now you can see everything. You can see how much it costs to move, who's paying for it, all that kind of stuff. If one group has almost all the supply and can dictate what happens to the price, or if it's pretty well distributed, and that has a whole lot of value. Some of them, not really Bitcoin right now, but some cryptocurrencies like, say, Dash, Bitcoin Cash, even Litecoin, 
are efficient to send and receive even in small amounts. So you don't have to pay a whole lot in credit card processing fees if you can pay just a couple cents or less in a lot of cases just to move funds anywhere in the world. And you can save a whole lot in both time and money making actual payments, of course, a huge use case. And of course, things you put on a distributed global ledger that can't really be attacked or altered by other parties easily is you have a single source of truth on things. Like you can put, let's say, encoded message or a reference to a file somewhere or whatever else you could imagine. Now, of course, the number one usage for this sort of single source of truth is in finding out who has what money, as in who owns the money. I own it, you own it, whatever. It's all public and transparent there. And that has a whole lot of utility. And over time, as more and more people start discovering this, the utility of that and other things will increase demand. And of course, the higher demand on that restricted supply will cause things to go up. Now, in the early days of Bitcoin, you had a whole lot of utility. You had a whole lot of people doing small things like micro tipping, you know, doing online gambling, dice games, things like that, just doing things they otherwise couldn't do with regular currencies and bank accounts and all that kind of stuff. And so that real utility caused a certain demand for it, which, you know, caused the price to go up. And at some point, people saw that demand, they saw that actual utility, and they started to speculate on just how useful this could be in the future. And since then, especially since the actual ability for Bitcoin to be used for these kinds of things has gone down because of network congestion, high fees, etc., etc., the speculative portion has gone way up. But it's really just that. It's utility and it's speculation all driving demand and demand on a scarce supply, a limited supply, causes the price to go up. And that's basically why cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are going up in value. Which brings me to an interesting point. How long do you think it'll be until fiat currencies or government controlled currencies start to really lose majority share as far as the money that people end up using? How long do you think it'll be until digital currencies that are scarce and decentralized start to take over as the number one thing people value and use for exchanging and holding value? Let me know in the comments. And finally, if you enjoyed this, I have a longer audio only podcast version that I put on Spotify, iTunes, all kinds of things. You can go to anchor.fm slash digital cash network and it's all there in case you want to hear me drone on more. None of this music stuff, none of the visuals, just more talk and more content. So check that out. And thanks everyone for watching. I will see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Throw me a few coins if you like what I do. If you don't like what I do, why are you even watching? I don't know. I ask myself the same thing sometimes. See you guys later.